My name is Justin, and I am a son of God and an addict and the host of the RICO 12 speaker meeting. I've been actively working recovery one day at a time since October of 2013. Welcome to RICO 12. We are an organization whose addictions include alcohol, drugs, lust, and sex, food, and gambling, just to name a few. We come together from all places, faiths, and backgrounds to learn the similarities of addiction and to gain tools and hope from others who are walking a similar path. We invite recovering addicts with at least one year sobriety and who are actively working their recovery in their respective fellowships to share their experience, strength, and hope on a live Zoom webinar each Friday at noon central time for 20 to 25 minutes. Then we, the live audience, get the opportunity to ask questions of that speaker for another 20 to 25 minutes. If you are hearing this meeting in recorded podcast form and would like to participate as a live audience member in the future, please go to www.reco12.com. That's R-E-C-O-1-2 dot com, like Recovery 12 Step, uh, to learn more and to submit your email address there to receive weekly invitations. Last week, we uh, got a few new reviews on Apple Podcasts, and that really helps us share the message with more addicts and helps us get the work, get, helps us work our 12th step. Yati said, such a great show, a must for all fellows and those who want to get a sense of the recovery journey. And also, there's great variety. Thanks, Yati. In any of the listen, if any of the listening audience finds meaning and worth in RICO 12, please consider rating and reviewing it in the podcast platform you use. Now, we look forward each week to receiving the light reflected from our speakers. That light inspires hope, meaning, worth, and growth in us, the listening audience. Now, let's introduce our guest speaker for the 80th RICO, speak, RICO 12 speaker meeting, uh, David G., whose topic is brought to where we stood. Now, here's a little bit about David. Uh, David G. from Oklahoma. He is a sober member of AA since um, August 8th, 1994 having had a life-changing spiritual experience in 1995 as a result of the 12 steps as outlined in our big book. He learned that he had no idea how to grow and develop, no idea how, how grow to, how to grow and develop with it. Sorry. (laughs) He soon found that yesterday's miracle wasn't sufficient for today. Other things begin, began to compete for that experience and they won out in 2019. He reached an emotional bottom in sobriety he learned that he suffered from a spiritual illness brought on by the human condition, it's, and that is self. He was freed in 2019 and has walked emotionally free ever since. His quote that this talk is based on is found on page 53 of the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. Had we not been brought to where we stood by a certain kind of faith? Take it away, David. Looking forward to hearing from you. All right. Thank you, Justin. Uh, my name is David. I am an alcoholic and an addict. And I'm very grateful to be here. I want to thank Justin for all the work he does with RICO 12. I've been privileged to hear a lot of the speakers, and uh, and I'm very grateful uh, to be here for the 80th. That that's that's quite a miracle. So thank you. Uh, <clears throat> you know, by God's grace, and um, as it's been revealed to me through the 12 steps, as outlined in our book Alcoholics Anonymous, I've been sober, clean and sober, from alcohol and drugs since August 8th of 1994. Uh, I have been sexually sober in the program of Sexaholics Anonymous since October 1st of 2019. Uh, you know, born here in Oklahoma, uh, you know, growing up in a very backwoods uh, sort of place, uh, there was a lot of abuse of all kinds that went on. And it was, uh, you know, I just, like we hear from a lot of our speakers, I just felt like I, I never fit in from the beginning. I just always felt that empty void. <clears throat> when I was... Um, 16 years old, I, uh, I, I made a decision that, um, that was life-changing. Uh, the, the abuse had continued. I'd lived in a lot of guilt and shame. Ideas, concepts, and beliefs, our book says, which was once the guiding force of the, the lives of these men. I see how that got developed from the time that I was a very small child by holding secrets, by believing things that wasn't true. This began to take shape in me, and it began to live as me. And when I was 16 years old with a stick of wood, I hit a man in the head and and it it eventually took his life. And uh, it it was a very, it was a very sad time, a very crazy time. And there was a lot of consequences to that. Uh, But, you know, from there, uh, you know, moving forward and growing up, drugs and alcohol was always a part of my life. Uh, You know, even before that incident took place, and it most definitely was after. 
uh, you know, I've been through a marriage. I had a couple of children and, uh, you know, I just don't like to get into a, to a story because the narrative uh, of self, you know, it likes to create a story and add to and either take away from. And I just don't like to get into all of that. I don't. So really, long story short, the inability to control my drinking and acting out, um, that's not what brought me to the 12 step recovery process. What brought me to the 12 step recovery process was the jumping off place described on page 152 in our book. And that's why I'm here today. Now, I could go into the story of all of that, how that took place and all that. But I, let me just tell you this. I, you know, through a lot of years of suffering, I ended up in the doors of, of Alcoholics Anonymous in 1994. <clears throat> and, uh, I was brought there by an incident that happened. I had, uh, I, I was running from the law. I, I was being chased. I, I ended up in, in a very, very rough area here in southeastern Oklahoma. You just do not come to this place and 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 act crazy. And I ended up starting a fire, burning most of the place down. And uh, you know, I ended up escaping that without getting killed, obviously. And I ended up with a bunch of full blood Native American Indians. And that's where my recovery began. They, they took me in. They began to teach me their ways, the sweat lodge. They began to teach me uh, the different ceremonies that they were a part of. And uh, my first spiritual experience ever was from a, from a sweat uh, lodge ceremony that had taken place in southeast Oklahoma. I had no idea what I was getting into that day. Whenever I went into that lodge, I, I had no idea what it even meant to to be there. But it didn't take very long for me to really fall in love with that way of life. And it's been that way ever since. That's been a part of my journey for the last 27 years. Now, whenever I came out of the lodge that day, you know, I, I was a, it was almost as if I was in another world. And that was my very first spiritual experience. Now, I'd like to say that self went away, left me alone, never returned. But those ideas, concepts, beliefs, emotions, and prejudice that I had adopted through the years that had begun to live as me and through me, um, I, I just thought that this is who I was. This is who I am. I mean, I would say it over and over, my resentments, my fears, my this, my that. All this time, I'm attached to self, and I don't even know that's happening to me. <clears throat> so... And leaving that place, uh, you know, I, I met a, a man that was full blood uh, Native American, and he took me through the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. He put me through the steps, and I had a life changing experience in 1995. Now, prior to that, there had been a year go by, and um, I mean, I, I was suffering from self and, and didn't even realize that that's what was happening. Um, all of these ideas and stuff began to come back. I was speaking at a meeting. Uh, shortly after I went through the steps with this man, I, I had an experience. It was, it was unbelievable for the first time in my life. I could see that everything that I thought, believed and felt was pretty much a lie that, the, that I was not the self I'd been identified with that. Our book in we agnostics talks about being, uh, going from the bridge of reason to the shore of faith. And it's almost like I had been carried over to the shore of faith. I mean, all of a sudden, everything was different. My life completely changed. I could feel the peace and the power of God in a way that I'd never felt it before. Now, I'd had some very strange beliefs when it came to God being raised Pentecostal. I could just never agree with that concept of God. But when that experience happened to me, I, 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 there was something quite different. Now, a lot of people were telling me that's wrong, David. That's not the way that it is. But that's the way that it was for me. I'd had an experience through this book, and it was very beautiful. And um, so I, I, my journey in recovery began. And I began to, uh, you know, speak at, at different groups and this and that. But I always had a hunger for this book. And, and I kept asking the man that had taken me through the, the full blood a Native American, you know, I need more. I need, you've only taken me this far in the book. I need more. And there's got to be more. And he said, you know, I've taken you as far as I can take you. I can't take you any further. He said, but I tell you what, there's a speaker, there's a conference going on in Oklahoma City, Oklahoma this weekend. It's called the Midwinter Conference. <clears throat> and there's a man there named uh, Charlie Parmley. Now, he was of Joe and Charlie, although I didn't know that. And uh, he said, if you will talk to him, he said, I think that he might be able to help you get to the next level of where you want to go with the book. So I went to the Midwinter Conference and I did meet Charlie and actually Charlie became uh, my sponsor shortly thereafter. And Charlie mentored me through the big book 
And that experience continued to grow and grow. So all of a sudden, I'm not only speaking at groups anymore. I begin to speak at conferences. I'm doing book studies all over the different places with, with this new message that I've found, this new inspiration. Life has changed completely. I, I feel the presence of God in a way that I've never felt it in my entire life. So everything outside of me obviously changes. You know, I, I, I get a job. I start having a career. I get married. I have a family. I have a home. Things that I never had never happened to me before. <clears throat> well, one evening I was speaking at a meeting in my hometown and I had been asked to speak there several times and they had asked me to come back. And there was a lady there that night that, that was listening to my story. And um, long story short, she came up and began to really uh, tell me how much she enjoyed the talk, this and that. And uh, temptation came over me that night in a way that I wasn't able to overcome. And I ended up stepping out with that incident. And um, that became an addiction that I just could not shut down. I tried every way in the world. You know, my idea was, and I could feel my experience begin to slip away from me. And I, and I was just devastated by it. So I thought, well, I'll just quit that. I won't do that anymore. Well, Charlie would always tell me, you know, if you can do something like that, then, you know, you've got a lot of willpower. And, you know, I, I would talk to these men, good men in recovery, to try to help me with the situation. Nobody seemed to be able to do that. And, and these incidents became more and more and more and more. And so, you know, I was just unable to shut down the obsession. By now, the experience had slipped away from me. The old ideas, the old prejudice, concepts, and beliefs had come back. And the next thing you know, I'm, I'm, I'm living a lie in sobriety. Our book says that the alcoholic is very much the a actor, and uh, I became very much the actor. Now, I was living one life in Alcoholics Anonymous with the circuit speaking and the book studies and the things that I was doing. And granted, a lot of people were being helped. A lot of people were being inspired. And I really think that that's the only reason that I didn't drink through all of those years of that. But anyway, uh, <clears throat> long story short with that is I ended up getting married in 2005. I'd met a lady in 2003 and we, we fell in love and it was, it was a beautiful relationship by God's grace still is to this day. But in 2005, we got married and, and that went away from me for a while. That obsession to do any of that, it went away. And I thought, well, this is wonderful. So uh, now I'm better. And, um, but within two years, it returned again. And uh, this time it stayed with me all the way until 2019. So for all those years, I'd really struggled with lust and sexual acting out and I just could not shut it down. And, um, you know, there again, I was doing a lot inside of the fellowship and uh, this ended up getting exposed in, <clears throat> in 2019. I had, uh, I had stepped out and, uh, and it became public knowledge and, uh, and I, it went, went downhill from there pretty quick. So the power of the mind and the ego and the self and the realization that I had with that at that time, I'm so completely identified with this now that I'm at a bottom, uh, at a bottom. I'm, I'm completely, I'm completely devastated. My marriage is most likely gone. I'm exposed in the fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous and it's, a, you know, it's self-will is running riot with me. <clears throat> so I was asked to come and do a, a big book study conference in Shreveport, Louisiana at the Tri-State Conference. And, uh, and I, I'd had a very rough week. Uh, you know, I'd been caught. All this was going on. My wife hadn't quite found out yet. And I knew in a short time it was going to be. So I needed to go to that conference just to get away. But the power of the mind really had me, uh, really had me uh, defeated. It really did. And so I, I remember going through an ego death without the psychedelics of any kind in 2019, in September of 2019, I met self one more time. And this time it was completely destructive. I could see it for what it was. And I just knew it was going to take me out. And I was crying to God. I was begging to God. I was doing every, everything that I could to try to get free from this. <clears throat> but it was almost the voice that I kept hearing was trust me, trust me. And I didn't want to hear that because I didn't know what that meant. But one of the things that, that I continued hearing as well from this voice that I hear quite often today, but couldn't hear it all at that time, was you're going to have to get honest. You are going to have to get honest with this. And uh, I, I did not want to do that. However, I did go to the, uh, the Tri-State Conference. I ended up um, 
uh, being discovered there that weekend. But uh, all of it came out with my wife. And <clears throat> they had uh, taken care of a, of a hotel for us to be at, and it had double beds. That's, and thank God, you know, because I, I was in one and she was in the other. And I can remember being so full of fear that night that it was just unbelievable. I mean, it was more fear than I had ever experienced in my life. I mean, I lost a son in recovery through the years, was able to overcome that with grace and all. But this really had me. It, it had me in a place that I just couldn't get free. And I can remember that night, you know, coming clean with her about this. And I, I just cried from the depths of my soul. It was, you know, and I'm a, I'm a pretty crazy guy. Most people that knows me, you know, I don't, I don't cry, but, but I did that night. I mean, it, it was just unbelievable the way it flooded out of me. Now, somewhere in that night, and, and this is how insane it was. I mean, she come over and began to comfort me. She was the one who was hurting so bad from this, but she come over and began to comfort me. And, and it was just a heartbreaking situation. Somewhere that night, I had just been burning up with a fever on the inside of me that I just could not get rid of, no matter what I tried to do. I'd been going through that for weeks and weeks. That night, it ended up breaking loose in me. And after getting honest with her, it was almost like something within me turned loose. She told me the next morning that she had sat on the edge of the bed to put her boots on uh, to leave or whatever, and the bottom of her pants were completely soaked. That's how, from the sweat that had released within me in the bed, it was, it was almost like something demonic had turned loose in me and, and let go. And so I didn't know what was going to happen. I had to go back and face the music with a lot of people. I had to get honest with a whole lot of People, I had been uh, the founder of a group in Southeast Oklahoma. It was a very strong group. I had to go to the church leaders that had given us that building for 14 years and become honest about all that. And, you know, I had nowhere else to turn. Uh, my marriage was going downhill, and she told me if I didn't get help and find a way out that she was leaving. But she was willing to stay there and give her another chance. So what happened was I ended up, I had been to Sexaholics Anonymous one time before it didn't last. Uh, you know, I, I, I thought that I was better than them. I knew more than them. And if they would just uh, do what I told them, everything would be okay in the fellowship. I went on a two-year hard relapse after that. And now I'm back in those rooms and saying, you know what, I was wrong. I was wrong. I need help. It didn't take me very long to discover that that the recovery as I had known it through the years and the recovery in the way that they were practicing it there was somewhat different. And I seen for me that, that it probably wasn't going to work out very well because there was a lot of meetings and there was a lot going on, but uh, there was not a whole lot of recovery and sobriety time there. And that really scared me and frightened me because I didn't know uh, what was going to happen. So anyway, I ended up going back through the work as outlined in the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. By now, I have nothing to hide. Everything's been stripped away. I have to admit for the first time that I don't know what's going on. And... I started, David, your sound is going down. I don't know if your mic's muffled okay. or, or something, but yeah, go ahead and continue. Thanks. Okay. So anyway, what, what happens is I end up, uh, I end up going back through the work as it's outlined in the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. And I have a spiritual experience again, that is absolutely life changing. And so here's what happened. I discovered that self through ideas, concepts, emotions, beliefs, attitudes, prejudice, as it's described on page 27, like I talked about earlier, is absolutely what's wrong with me now. All of a sudden, the bell is lifted, and I begin to see that I have identified with self one more time, and that's what's brought me to the destruction of where I'm at. So on page 27 there's of our big book, Alcoholics Anonymous, there was a conversation between Dr. Carl Jung and a man named Roland Hazard. Roland had went through what I'd went through. It's been a year with Young, and, and he had ended up drinking after a year, and he just couldn't figure out why. And so he went back and asked the doctor, are there any exceptions? The doctor said, no. He said, there are, but he said, I, I've rarely seen it. But, but here's what really grabbed me as I began to come back through the work this time. He says, they appear to be in the nature of a huge emotional displacement and rearrangement. And that's what had happened to me as a Going through that work without knowing it, I had really began to displace and have a rearrangement of those ideas, attitudes, and emotions. In fact, our book goes on to say that, that these are the things that were once the guiding force of the lives of these men. 
So if I take that word guiding force and I turn it around, it's like it's a force that's guiding me. And really what I do is I begin to see that for what it is. And it's very well laid out in our book. The way that I read the book now is, I mean, I, I see it completely different than I ever have. <clears throat> so he says, you know, that, that a new set of conceptions and motives, they come in and begin to dominate these men. And that's what happened to me. The, the, the conceptions came in, uh, a, an emotional rearrangement happened. I began to have a spiritual experience and, uh, so there in the, in the chapter, there is a solution. It talks about two powers. One is the power of the fellowship to support you. The other is the power of the spiritual experience to bring you to this rearrangement. And that's what had happened to me. I ended up having that experience and I wasn't even looking for it to happen. So as I went through the book, I began to see that it really didn't talk so much about spirituality in, in the first few chapters other than you know, other than that, that's what was going to have to take place in order for me to recover. But people say, you know, it, it, I'm sick physically, mentally, and spiritually. But what I learned through that experience and through the work that I've done since that time, is that that's not the truth. And we get a very clear look at that from the beginning of the book. And there on page 31, you know, where it says, here are some of the methods we have tried, you know, limiting the number of drinks, that's mental, never drinking alone. That's mental. Never, never drinking in the morning. <clears throat> that's mental. Drinking only at home. That's physical. And as you read through that, you see mental, physical, mental, physical, mental, physical. But you really never see anything about it being spiritual. Now, I'm running around believing that I'm spiritually sick, that my soul is sick. Now, I know on page 64, it says that we are, you know, that we are spiritually sick. But if you read that very carefully in the way that it's describing it there, we begin to see that that we are absolutely not, our soul is not sick. The sickness has been brought on by a human condition. So the reason that I picked the topic that I did brought to where we stood, because it's on uh, page 53 of our book, it says this, that was natural, talking about these feelings that had constructed our life. Here's what it looks like for me, just an example. These ideas would always come into my mind these conceptions, these beliefs, I would act on them. And whenever I'd done that, that would give birth to the reality that was going on with me. Now I would pray to God and, but uh, you know, I had no idea that I was praying to the God of reason. I just did not know that. <clears throat> so when I get to page 53 in the big book, it says this, that was natural, but let us think a little more closely without knowing it. And here's the key words without knowing it, because I don't even know this is happening to me. I can't see it. The bell has not been lifted. It says, have we not been brought to where we stood by a certain kind of faith? Now, I always thought that was talking about faith in God, but that's absolutely not talking about faith in God as I know God today. That's talking about faith in this power of reason, this thinking, uh, these ideas, beliefs, attitudes, and emotions. And, you know, here's what I've learned since that experience. Thoughts emotions they don't ruin my day faith in these thoughts and emotions that's what ruins my day in fact on the very next page 54 it says this have we not come to believe in our own reason that's small r there not capital it says uh did we not have confidence in our ability to think and here's where i start seeing it in this sentence right here it says what was that but a sort of faith so what i had done is i'd put faith and self-reliance upon this condition. And I didn't even realize that that had happened to me. And whenever I began to see that clearly the veil lifted, I began to have a spiritual experience. And, and not only did I get sober, I recovered from a hopeless state of mind. And it was, you know, it was the most beautiful experience. This time I know what to look for because I had that experience back in 1995. I was carried to the shore of faith. I was running around there, but nobody ever told me, David, continue to watch, continue to watch for self. Continue, because if you don't, you're going to end up right back where you were at. <clears throat> so some of the things that have happened to me since that time, I've sponsored, I, I today sponsor about 20 men in the program of Sexaholics Anonymous. By God's grace, every one of those men are sober today and beginning to wake up from self. Now, that has nothing to do with me, trust me, other than bringing this experience to them. Honesty comes from, uh, it comes to me. It doesn't come from me, for sure. So here's what I learned in inventory as well. 
I'm not really writing about who I am. I hear that in the meetings a lot. I, I get to discover who I am through inventory. That's not my experience. It's not about who I am. What I'm writing about is who I've become based on a narrative that was given to me by self, which is ideas, concepts, attitudes, and beliefs. And here's why I say that uh, about that page. And, and I, you know, I don't want to, you know, I mean, if your experience is different, that's your experience. But, uh, you know, on page 64 of our, our literature, it's very clear, very clear to me. <clears throat> it says this. We took stock honestly. First, we searched out the flaws in our makeup, which caused our failure. Being convinced that self manifest in various ways is what had defeated us, we considered this common manifestation. So there's two things that jump at me here. One is self, the other is us. It is not the same. Now, prior to this, I mean, it's a, it's a beautiful description of it. I don't have time for that. But, but anyway, it says we considered this common manifestation, talking about selves, not ours. So let's look at one of the common manifestations. Resentment is the number one offender, it talking about resentment, destroys more alcoholic sexaholics than anything else, alcohol, sex, or any of that. From it, talking about resentment, stem all forms of spiritual disease. Not from the spirit, not from the soul, from it, resentment, which is a common manifestation of self, self-manifested. See, I thought it was me out here doing all this. What I've come to learn is self doesn't have arms and legs. It uses mind. It's disguised itself as me. I believe that it was me and I'm running around and I'm doing all this stuff and I can't understand why I kept be getting beat up after I've worked the steps. I get way up in the steps and a lot of these ideas, attitudes and emotion, I'm not good enough. I'm too fat. I don't have enough hair. I don't have this. I don't have that. All of this stuff starts flooding back in on me and I don't know how to handle any of that. And I end up, I don't drink or I don't use nor I don't act out, but I stay emotionally void. And that's what's happened to me. In fact, when I get to page 66, it's very clear. When it talks about resentment, it says that we squander the hours that might have been worthwhile. We found it is fatal. But here it is. It says, when harboring such feelings, talking about resentment, we shut ourselves off from the sunlight of the spirit. Not the spirit, the sunlight of the spirit. So the human condition shuts me off from the sunlight of the spirit, disguises itself, makes me believe that it's my soul that is sick, and that I'm not going to get better unless I do this. I sponsor more guys, read more books, go to more meetings, do this, do that. I do all that stuff, and I'm still emotionally dead on the inside, and I can't figure out why. When I get to principles and inventory this time, I take a very different look at it because now we're talking about values and beliefs about David, the things that I believed about me. And these are the things that I took a look at in inventory and was able to hold those beliefs to the light after 25 years and was able to let them go. It's been a beautiful process ever since. I've walked emotionally free. Uh, step 10 has become, <clears throat> 10 and 11 is all about the new thought awareness. You know, that's all it talks about is, you know, this thought, or, you know, how can I best serve these? These are thoughts which must go with us constantly. You know, on awakening, let us think about the 24 hours ahead. We ask God to direct our thinking. We will see that our, you know, God gave us brains to use uh, on and on and on. We ask God for in inspiration, intuitive thought. So it's all about, you know, one system of thought is unreal. The other is real. Which one am I living in today, even in my sobriety? Uh, page 84, real quick. I know my time's about up. I'll, I'll, I'll end here. But it says, there's five things that I need to watch for as outlined in step 10. And I've never done this in all the years. <clears throat> I've just never done it. It says this, these five things that I'm going to continue to watch for self, dishonesty, resentment, and fear, because if I don't, it's going to begin to roll down the hill like a snowball again, and it's going to get bigger and bigger until it takes me out. So I need to watch. Uh, when these crop up, you know, I ask God at once to remove them. You know, um, it's just, it's beautiful the way it lays it out here. When these crop up, I ask God it wants to remove them. I discuss them with someone immediately, make amends quickly. If I've harmed anyone, then turn my thoughts to someone I can help. I don't even have to help anyone. I just need to turn my thoughts in that direction to do that because it's all in my thoughts anyway, right? Five things it's asking me to do. One is watch. Two is ask. Three is to apologize. Um, four is to... Uh, uh, make amends quickly. If I've harmed anyone, five is to turn my thoughts to someone I can help. And once I do that, 
I'm placed back in that position of neutrality, safe and protected, not from lust, not from alcohol or drugs, but from the self that always convinces me that it's me. I've walked emotionally free ever since that day. Uh, I've looked to go back through the work many times. I'm to a point now to where a lot of people don't want to take me through it because of my experience, and that's okay. I'm okay with that today. But I am uh, returning to my uh, Native American ways. I'm, I'm beginning to work with shamans and do different things in my spirituality. And God has really, it, God has blessed my life in a way. My marriage is in a better place than it's ever been. My son is heroin free from after many years. Uh, this experience has happened to 20 men, uh, and, and I'm seeing a fellowship grow up about me in a way I never could have uh, other than imagined. So God is good. Thank you so much for allowing me to come here to talk today. And if you're new, relatively new to this, please stick around. The miracle does happen. Thanks, Justin. Glad to be here. Awesome. Thank you so much, David. That was amazing. There was a lot of uh, heavy stuff. I'm going to have to listen to this a couple of times and 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 figure a lot of that heavy stuff out in my own walk in recovery, because there's just so much there. Uh, A quick reminder to our live audience, you can definitely ask questions of David here. Please type them in the Q&A link at the bottom of your Zoom window. Looks like two speech bubbles over the top of each other. I will moderate those as they come in. Um, I've written down several questions, and we'll get started on the Q&A portion now of this meeting. First question I have for you, going back towards the, uh, the first part of your share, David, you talked about, um, you know, being a long time active, um, doing the part of Alcoholics Anonymous, speaking, sponsoring, carrying the message all over the place, and then um, recognizing that uh, um, your relationship, your sex relations were just um, uh, in trouble. Did you find it necessary? And it sounds like you did, but I want to understand why. Why was it necessary, do you think, to start attending a second fellowship that was specific to sex uh, issues, for example? Why do you think that was necessary for you? Well, for me, it was because I had tried everything else. I had um, went back through the steps the way that they were, that they had been given to me before and you know, I would get a little bit of relief, but but the obsession would always return and I would go again and again. So here's what happened. The last time that I went through through this work with a man from Cedar Rapids, Iowa, he had very much taken me through it the way that he had been taken through it by the late Don Chris. That's my sponsorship lineage. And he was the first man that had ever sat down with me after the fifth step was over, after he listened to the fifth step in recovery. And he said, David, you're going to have to find people that can help you. He said, the Fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous is not going to be able to help you. <clears throat> and I felt like Roland Hazard as, as the gates of hell, you know, the doors had closed with a plane. I said, my God, you know, that scares me to death to hear you say that. And he said, you're going to have to find people that have been through the same thing that you've been through, walk in the road that can help you with that. I mean, you have the program sober but a lot of us don't relate to you and what you've been through with that so you need to find people who do and i knew immediately where to go uh, because i'd been there one time before and it and it didn't take i wasn't ready or whatever uh, the case may be but for me that was the reason that that i returned to a second fellowship and uh thank god i did because i met people that were able to understand me. I could talk about this freely with them. There was no judgment. There was no criticism. There was brotherhood. And I was able to uh, uh, begin my journey of recovery with that. Thank you so much. You know, I, I, my first thought was, is it that the solution was not found in Alcoholics Anonymous? But no, I don't think that's it. It's not the solution. It's the fellowship. It's the understanding. It's being with like-minded, like experienced people who have done that. Thank you for clarifying that. I, I really appreciate it. And I'm experiencing some of that myself right now. So um, next question I have for you, David, is you talked about, and, and this was all about the self, um, but, you know, the, and you talked a little bit about Dr. Jung and Roland Hazard, Well, one of the Jungian philosophies or, or theories uh, is doing shadow work, looking deep into the shadows, into the darkness of self, uh, uh, and 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 where are we? What drives us? How 
how often do you think it is you need to really take an honest look, even at the darkest parts of yourself and able to enable to uh, uh, put light on it and, and, and make it true, show it truth. I don't know if that makes sense, but what, how often do you have to look into the shadows and, and, and put light on the darkness? You know, the ones that haunted me for so many years in my past, you know, is, is so ingrained in my memory. The, the bottom that I hit in 2019 that I haven't had to go back and look at any of that again because I'm still very much familiar with that. However, by doing the 10th step, as it's outlined in our book on the daily, I'm able to see that as it begins to come at me now. Uh, when it, The thoughts, you know, I, I think for so long I thought that it was an entity. But it's not. It's very much an activity that goes on in the mind. It's very, our book is very clear about that. And uh, so whenever those things begin to arise, even a thought, uh, not to say that I'm pure in thought all day long, that, that's just not true. But, but when I do recognize that, you know, that, wait a minute, that's not the right way of thinking. For me, I begin to take a look at that shadow right then. Uh, like it says, continue to watch him when these crop up, not if, when. So they're coming. Uh, you know, we ask God it wants to, remain. and I just go right through that formula with it. Now, what had happened, it does say that we discuss it with someone immediately. And a lot of people will disagree with this concept. I don't really care if you do or not. It's working for about 20 men. We created a group to where we could obviously not call each other all day long to discuss every thought or emotion that comes up. So what we do is we text that, you know, hey, I've spotted fear. I've spotted lust. I've spotted resentment. You know, I've asked God to remove it. Now I'm turning my thoughts to someone I can help. And we're constantly all day long checking those emotions or checking those uh, thoughts in and emotions before they become a reality so that we end up not acting on them. So we're watching for that all day long, the way that it's outlined there. <clears throat> now, some people says it doesn't say anything about that. That's true. It doesn't. But it does say discuss it with someone immediately. So we have found that this works uh, better than anything else ever could. And. So I, I watch for those shadows um, constantly. I do. I mean, e even if I'm out, like I'm out today and, and you know, and I'm in the public and, and I watch the thoughts. I don't so much. But, but what I've learned with this, Justin, is the emotions are tied to the thoughts. And see, I, I didn't know that before. You know, I would always think when fear cropped up, well, you know, that's. That's just what it is. That's what the thought is. But see, that's not the thought. That's the emotion. The thought began before the emotion ever hit me so you know that's what i try to pay attention to today and, and i keep very close eye on that and having a couple of years of experience in doing that now has made it a whole lot easier for me so i hope that answers your question Thanks. yeah i think so one thing that uh um i've had several people <clears throat> talk to me about and ask me about when i um lead with my weaknesses you know when i say you know i'm I, i'm really struggling with selfishness or pride or or, you know, whatever other character defects are popping their head up, fear that are coming in there. Um, a lot of people will say, why do you focus on those? Why, why not focus on the fact that uh, you're a good person, a good person worthy of recovery or whatever? Um, how do you balance that? Yes, I'm constantly watching for these defects, these, these um, um, emotions, these thoughts, the, these thoughts coming in rather than um, positive things. How do you balance that in your own recovery, David? Well, the one thing that I, that I had to realize, and, and I didn't know this until it was pointed out to me and, it, and I pointed out to others, is that really, I'm, you know, I, I'm, I'm not my mind, I'm not the body, you know, I'm not my thinking. But what I am is I, I'm the one who is aware of all of that stuff. It's kind of like somebody comes to me and says, hey, I had a bad dream. And, well, who was it that's aware that you had a bad dream? It, it was you. You come back a couple of days later and say, hey, I didn't dream at all. Or I had a good dream. Well, who was aware of that? So when that was pointed out to me, what I began to do is to use that with thoughts and emotions as well. You know, I, I began to see those. And I, I try to come from a place which is called the witness seat to where I can just witness and be aware of those thoughts. And really, for me, that kind of balances itself out. And, you know, I'll put, let's see, what is that? Page 57, I think, or 56 there in the big book, right at the very end of We Agnostics, it says, you know, when we drew near to him, he disclosed himself to us. So whenever I 
put eyes on false thinking, I begin to see that this is not who I am, who I am. I'm created in the image of God. This is who I am. Then automatically, you know, I didn't have to look for God or I didn't have to do any of that. I didn't have to try to balance anything out. All of that began to happen for me through this process. And uh, that was very much a part of the spiritual experience for me. Thank you. I, I appreciate that. And I loved the, what you called the witness seat, you know, putting, putting myself, you know, oftentimes I've heard it said getting out of my own head or, or getting out of self. I, I love how you call it the witness seat of just observing yeah. what's going on. That's a, a, that phrase for me is really powerful. All right. Quick reminder, once again, to our live audience, if you have a question for David, please type it in the Q and a link at the bottom of your zoom window. We'd love to hear some questions from you. I've got another question here. Um, you you talked about praying to the God of reason. Tell me more about that. And I know you talked a little, you expounded a little bit more on it, but I'd love to dig a little bit deeper. What does that mean when you pray to the God of reason and how is that um, hurtful or helpful either way? Well, all along, you know, I, I would be praying to God for relief or I would be praying for, you know, do this for me, do that for me, or help me be a better husband, help me be a better father, help me, 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 me. It's all there. You know, I, even I'm, I'm praying completely wrong, and I don't even know that's happening. And uh, because I think I'm praying with good motive, but really what I'm, what I'm praying is all about me. And our book is very clear on that. You know, we can ask for ourselves only if others may be helped. Well, a lot of people would say, yeah, but you know, your wife would be helped by you being a good husband. No, my wife would be helped if, if I show her a good husband. See, and, and I say this uh, about my mother as well. You know, I I don't need a mother. She needs a son that, that is recovered, that is present, that is aware of what is going on. So I like what I read there and, and what brought me to the topic that I brought here with me today, brought to where we stood by a certain kind of faith without knowing it, had we not been brought to that. See, I don't even realize I'm doing this, but once I pray, I'm very much being led on which way to go, what to do, and I'm, I haven't had an awakening, so I'm following my thinking. The book says, what is that but a sort of faith that we're entirely dependable on, on this thinking? So all of my prayers <laughs> have, have been directed in that way, only I didn't know it. Now, I'm not saying that I didn't, I haven't had things happen to me that I know that that could only have come from God. I'm not saying that at all. Uh, but what I am saying is, is that whenever I pray, what ends up, the reality that ends up happening in my life, you can very much tell that that wasn't from God. That was from self. So really what had happened is, is the prayer that I put out into the universe, thinking that I was praying to God. Really, I was praying to self. I just didn't know it. So love that. And one of my mentors in, uh, in recovery, he talks through steps 10, 11, 12, kind of like this. I need to watch. And that's step 10, watch. And if I'm not watching, and I'm going to quote him, I won't know what the hell to pray for in step 11. So I pray for what I see. And then I go and do, I get my marching orders in that prayer and go and do. But like what you said, turn my thoughts to others. Sometimes it's more of a, okay, I'm going to pray for that other person rather than get up and go do something for that other person. But uh, I love that watch, pray, and then go and do. Excellent. Yeah. Um, what, uh, what other, um, David, what other words of wisdom or advice do you have for someone who is brand new in walking into maybe the rooms of recovery for the first time this last week, and they listen to this, what words of advice do you have for that person? Well, the one thing that I would say more than anything else is find a strong support group. And, you know, it, it was told to me that take a few minutes before the meeting, listen to the chatter that's going on, listen to the people inside of the room, what they're saying, and listen to them a few minutes after the meeting is over. And if what they're talking about outside of that or outside of the Zoom call, doesn't line up with what they've been talking about inside that meeting, it may be a pretty good idea just to uh, disregard all of that and 
look for something else. I mean, I've, I've learned to be respectful about that. But if you're brand new, and this is what I tell my guys, there's the difference between staying sober and recovering from the disease of alcoholism, sexaholism, which is ultimately self. I don't really care what your addiction is. It all takes off from the same airport, and that's self. We're very aware of that now. But if I can't find somebody that can put me into the book and show me the directions on how to recover rather than to tell me what to do with my life, if anybody is new, I would I would really ask you to consider watching for that because that's what I see in our fellowship more and more. There's a lot of wonderful things said. Uh, we must go do interventions. We must do my, my book says none of that. It says, you know, if we are to find God, the desire must come from within. And uh, so there's a lot of things that we hear in the room that doesn't line up with the book and, and that don't line up with our book. And so I would uh, I would be very careful about a whole lot of talk. I, I would be looking more for someone who is demonstrating a life outside of the outside of the fellowship, who has a good marriage, who has a good uh, career going for them, people that are, are respected people that that can put you into that that has time to take time to talk with you there's so many things that that i tell new guys my guys i start in step 10 day one i don't care if they've been here one day or they've been here 10 years i don't care because if you're not watching for this it's going to slip back up and overtake you in your thoughts it just is now i'll now that i do tell them this What this looks like now and what this will look like after we work the first nine steps as outlined in our book is going to be a completely different experience. But you've got to have something to hold on to right here and to watch for those thoughts daily. Send me a nightly review by email answering those nine questions on page 86. Be very specific with that. I start them with that from day one. And I have seen that that has more... uh, seems to be more effective than anything else. And, and old timers would, would question me and challenge me on this. They'd say, yeah, well, why, why do you do that? I mean, you know, it doesn't say in our book anything about doing that. It very much says something in our book about doing that. It says this thought brings us to step 10, which suggests we continue to take personal inventory to continue to set right any new mistakes as we go along. We vigorously commence this way of living as we cleaned up the past. So as we clean up the past in the first nine steps, we vigorously commence this way of living from day one. The founders of our of our of Alcoholics Anonymous self-examination prayer and meditation started day one, not day 50 when you get to that point. So yeah, please just uh, find somebody that 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 has recovery, not just sobriety. Mm, love that. And and with that, I'd like to ask you this question if you wouldn't mind defining for me and for our audience the difference between abstinence, sobriety, and recovery. Is there a difference between those three terms? You talked about sobriety and and recovery difference, but is there a difference in those three terms? And if so, what is it? You know, for me, it looks like this. I know know how to stop. Just, Just quit. Just don't pick up anymore. But how do you live with the emotions, the ideas, the concepts, and beliefs that beat me up on the daily? How do you live with that without returning back to something to take that mental stress away from you, no matter what that may be? So if I'm just absent in the rooms and I'm coming to the rooms and I'm emotionally feeling like something's not connected on the inside, that's because I haven't experienced recovery yet. Now, I do have sobriety, yes. But um, <clears throat> for me, that's what that looks like. You know, recovery is found in, in our literature. The very first promise in the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous is this is the story of how many thousand men and women have recovered, not sober not recovering, recovered from a hopeless state of mind and body. And, uh, you know, in, in fact, on the title page, it's recovered from alcoholism. But as you move into it, you you begin to see pretty quick. So for me, that's how it's defined. You know, if you want to stay sober, just don't pick up. If you want to learn how to live that way and not return to it, there's some things that we're going to have to do here to enter the fellowship of the spirit. And and that's that's my take on that. So. Love it. Thank you so much. All right. We're going to start uh, winding things up here. Do you have any final words of wisdom that you'd like to share with us that maybe uh, we haven't touched on yet? Well, I just want to say thank you to everybody that's out there listening. And and I just want you to know, and I say this to all the guys that I work with, if I've said something here that doesn't agree with your recovery or or something that your sponsor has told you, and I tell all my guys this, 
your sponsor is right, not me. You you go with what your sponsor tells you to do. Um, if if you find yourself, you know, going going through that process and emotionally continuing to get beat up by by these old thought patterns and emotions of fear and stuff like this, then you know, I would just I would strongly suggest that that you just look in a little deeper. You you don't have to get rid of your sponsor or anybody like that. You know, just take a different look at this because there's so much more here. I, there's a friend. He's a friend of mine. I don't know him personally, but but he says this. He said that uh, he was taken to a Dallas Cow- Cowboy football game uh, uh, by a guy one time. And the guy, they parked in the back and they walked up a long hallway and they got all the way up to the top. And the guy said, oh, I didn't tell you, we're going to set up here with the with the owners. Is that OK? And he's like, Is that OK? Yes, that's OK. Absolutely. That's OK. And he said what, what he experienced was something completely different than he had ever seen on TV that he could have ever experienced just sitting in the in the stands with the rest of the people. He said he's seen that there was a, a whole nother level to this. Going through this work is outlined in the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous with somebody who's been through it, somebody that can help you to have an experience, not tell you how to have one. It's a completely different level. There are more levels to this deal than we than we even realize. So I just encourage anybody that's new, keep coming, keep coming, no matter what, keep coming here. And don't leave until the miracle happens because it will. And uh, so, again, thank you so much, Justin, for your service. And, and thanks to everybody that's listening. Thank you, David. That was a great RICO 12 weekly speaker meeting for all addicts and those wanting to learn more about addiction and the recovery therefrom. If we didn't get to your question or if you have other questions, go to RICO12.com forward slash forum and join in our community and ask those questions and answer others' questions that may come up. I invite the audience to come back next week. If you've not yet uh, rated and reviewed the podcast and Apple Podcasts, go do so now. It's a great way to work your Step 12 and our Step 12 and sharing this message with others. Uh, Next week, we will be hearing from Eric J., whose topic will be How Denial Fuels Addiction. Now let's launch off into the rest of our day with a really cool prayer that David chose. Have at it, David. Thank you again, Justin. This is a prayer that I use quite often and has, has definitely brought about the experience in my life. God, please remove the veil that I may see what is really happening here and that I don't get intoxicated by stories and by fears. Amen. Amen. Keep coming back, everybody. It works when you work it. So work it. You are worth it.